I was like a regular on a boxing podcast for about two years in the UK that was that was quite popular actually for a while but then the guy who was doing it wanted to quit and so it kind of that was the end of that also you're a boxing fan oh like I'm a I'm a hardcore boxing fan for a while I was really really hardcore but since the coronavirus has hit I've kind of I don't know I've kind of fallen back from it a bit so I'm a total MMA casual I'm actually not really that much of a fan of MMA but like and you're doing what for MMA what I had thoughts of doing for like boxing I think it's actually not bi-directional I find most people who like MMA also like boxing but not everybody who likes boxing likes MMA yeah it's weird like for me it's like you know, boxing is brutal too, but I, I find MMA nearly too brutal for me. I don't know if people say that to you much. Yeah, I've heard that. I think also if you like boxing a lot uh, and you watch MMA, especially now, a lot of MMA, unlike in the past, is contested standing now, like a lot of striking on the feet. Not like in the early days where it was a lot more resting intens- intensive. And that's all like going back to Marxism and critique of capitalism. That's all because of incentives, right? They started incentivizing people <laughs> to not take it to the ground and just try to knock each other out. So it's actually much, much more headshots than boxing. But if you're a boxing enthusiast and you watch, and now it's mostly like small glove boxing, really, it's not that good. Because if you're used to like high level boxers, that's what you're watching. And then you watch MMA. That's the other component besides the violence. It's also they're not very good at that portion of it which is like 80% of MMA now because of the incentives, because everybody gets paid so little, everybody wants to earn a bonus. And for you to earn a bonus, you need a knockout. So everybody's just swinging haymaker. So it looks like small glove, crappy boxing a lot of times. I could also see that being a deterrent. Yeah, and I I think the wrestling styles would dominate. Do they not get the bonuses for like a a tap out uh, as same way as a, a knockout uh not as often yeah because the, the wrestlers were dominating actually let, let's just kick into the interview and we'll start fuck it we're, sure we're gonna talk all this shit <laughs> let's record it all right um, this could be the cold open right like a lot of uh podcasts do the cold open and then they do the intro song and then there we go Hello and welcome to the 142nd episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday, 17th of December, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, we are chatting with Sam from the Southpaw Pod about socialism and combat sports. Sam is one half of the Southpaw Pod, which is a socialist MMA podcast, a real pioneer in the world of radical sports podcasting. Part two of this episode be released as a patron only episode in a couple of days. This week I have the new patron Ove Lundberg who signed up for an annual contribution to thank. Make sure to buy your Christmas copy of Eric Olin Wright's Understanding Class which will be the new reading group series starting in January. Now before we rejoin the discussion listeners may know that previous guest Dick Hunzinger aka Millions of Dead Landlords aka Dick O'Frenick from Twitter, who was on the Vibing for Crisis episodes, has been arrested by the feds in Atlanta for his work in the George Floyd uprisings. He's currently stuck in an ICE detention centre awaiting a date for his hearing. You can help him out by giving money to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. You can also check out the Twitter handle at Defend Richard to follow developments in his case. You can also slide into their DMs if you want to get details on how you can send Dick some money so he can spend it in the prison commissary. All the links are in the show notes. Okay, let's rejoin the discussion. Today, I'm delighted to have a long-time Twitter follow. We've been following each other, a fellow podcaster in a niche podcasting section, which is kind of like socialist MMA podcast. We've got Sam from the South Paw Pod. How's it going, Sam? I'm as good as to be expected living in the US in the time of Corona and Biden Trump transition. You're in you're California. Yeah. What's the coronavirus like? Is it out of control in California? Yeah, I don't know when you're going to release this, but by the time it comes out, we might be like pretty close to a more heavy duty lockdown in the state. 
they just started saying last week that restaurants, a lot of restaurants that are doing outdoor dining have to close again because the numbers are just just skyrocketing again. But that's across the nation. It's grim. It shows like the real dysfunction of American political social life, doesn't it? Yeah. America was an experiment and I don't think the world considers it a success because nobody else, you know, that were formed after the world wars and, and so forth adopted our exact system. Yeah, it's true. You know, when I was a kid growing up, you know, like some of our relations would be in America and, you know, they'd come home and they'd be like, oh, they're back from America, you know, the land of money and gold <laughs> and fortune. And with all everybody, like all the mad US propaganda, we're always like, you know, thinking, God, America is the greatest place in the world. But like nowadays, like, you know, people look at America, like even my, like my parents say, who are, you know, in their 70s, who would have been like JFK is God, you know, that kind of a thing. And like now they're looking at America and they just go, Jesus, it's a total shit show. <laughs> it's like a massive uh, kind of soft power element to America has just like coronavirus has seen it like whatever about the Iraq war, coronavirus has nearly been I think it's been just maybe even more devastating because it, it's it doesn't just show they're going to go in and do a war. It shows that, you know, they're uniquely dis, like kind of dysfunctional at home, you know, and I, I think that's it's been a, quite an eye opener to like just normies in Europe. Yeah, I think even maybe leftists in Europe or, you know, social Democrats or whatever even if it's whatever version of European liberal is still further left than what we have here in the US. But I think even for them, they, they saw that America was kind of imperialist internationally, but they got their stuff together domestically, right? And then this showed, no, we don't even have our stuff together domestically. Yeah, and like people don't, I suppose a lot of Europeans, you know, they, they might go on a holiday to New York or someplace in, you know, Miami or something like that. And they see probably are, are quite the rich areas in America, but they don't, you know, they don't travel across the country much. You know, like I did a few road trips. I did one from L.A. to Nevada, New Mexico, Ar Arizona. I think, you know, kind of a, a loop like that. Christ, you'd be driving through the desert like in, I don't know, I don't know which state it was, probably like Arizona or somewhere. And you'd see off in the middle of the desert from off to your like highway or whatever you're on, be like kind of white spots. And you just, it took me a while to figure out they were kind of like trailer park communities just off in the desert. This is really quite shocking, you know, you know, like that there's there's like really bad poverty all over the place in America that, you know, Europeans or people, they just. They don't even really know it exists, you know? Well, you drove around, right? And even not going from coast to coast, you saw how massive the U.S. is. So it is such a big piece of land. It's easier to just kind of tuck the poverty away into places that visitors might not see. You know, the U.K. is like that, too. Like, the U.K. is very bad poverty. Like, anyway, we're going off track here. Tell us about your podcast. What, what got you into starting like a socialist MMA podcast? I was just thinking about this because I've explained it like different ways every time I've been asked. I was thinking about this meme that's become popular where it's like no one and then somebody says something that nobody needed you to say, right? And I was thinking about that relating to what I did where it was like no one and then me saying, hey, who wants a socialist MMA podcast, right? <laughs> and it was something nobody wanted, but I did it anyway, me and a friend. So initially, it was just me talking into the void or me and my friend talking to each other into the void. And then, I don't know, people started listening, people started finding me online. And then this year, really, a lot more people found the podcast, a lot more people found the social media, a lot more people found me on Twitter. So it's no longer like no one, right? It, it felt lonely for a while, this niche. But then after... This year, it really is like, no, I'm not alone. Every day, I'm reminded I'm not alone. And to give people uh, an idea of what a socialist MMA podcast is, it was really like trying to counteract the Joe Rogan experience because that was like the only podcast for a long time for anybody who liked combat sports or mixed martial arts. So when I say combat sports, I also mean boxing. If you wanted to even see like, you know, Evander Holyfield or somebody like that on a podcast or Roy Jones, you still had to go to Joe Rogan, right? And the thing is, is really he has two podcasts 
in one, which is he talks about combat sports with combat sport athletes. And then he talks to reactionary shitheads, right? What happened was he used the combat sports to lure people in. And then they, they came for that, but they stuck around for the interviews with like Alex Jones. And so in a way he pilled them, right? So I think for right wingers having interviews that has nothing to do with combat sports and then talking exclusively about combat sports isn't that weird where when i try to explain it to people on the left that yeah my interviews like if i bring on a guest we don't have to talk about combat sports at all that kind of confuses them because they want like one general theme but just like him just like him as in joe rogan i've passively just from people listening people who just came over from the mma have gone from being apolitical or not really thinking about it, or there's two different challenges. There's liberals, mainline liberals here in the US, and also Republicans here or reactionaries here, right? And they they both have different challenges in trying to talk to them about the left. And I've gotten people from both crowds turning to socialism. I don't yell at them. I don't, you know, browbeat them, just kind of like Rogan, you know, just interview people, right? I don't, I don't talk to them about it like hitting them over the head with it when I'm talking MMA. And somehow that passive kind of combining of these ideas does work in making people think about socialism in a positive light. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think we look back to the, you know, whatever, this golden age of socialism in the, you know, 10s or 20s in Germany. And they had like socialist, you know, football clubs, socialist photography clubs, if we want to actually get towards like a socialist society, we, we need to create like our own socialist culture. And I just think it's a great idea. It's something I've toyed with myself, setting up a boxing, a communist boxing podcast or something. And when I saw y- your one, I was like, brilliant. It, it's a sign that like shit's starting to happen Some, somewhere something is happening that we're getting MMA socialist podcasts no it definitely you know? was a spirit of the time because like I guess I was ahead of everybody who thought about this because after I started this podcast like six months later or a year later or even now I find people DMing me where they're like I found you just because I was thinking about doing the same thing and I wanted to see if anybody had already done one and then I found you so I guess from around when I started to even today, there are people independently coming up with this idea, whereas they had never thought about this prior to that. So there's definitely something in the air, whether I realized it or not. Let's talk a little bit about the MMA and its politics, because like MMA kind of seems to have a very white audience. Is that a fair, a a white reactionary audience? Is, Is that a fair comment? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's fair. You know, compared to, say, boxing, which tends to be much more, I would think, a black and Hispanic, you know, they're typically the biggest selling stars in America are black fighters and Hispanic fighters. And it's a long time since there was a major white fighter in America in boxing. The the, the fans seem to have shifted from, I think a lot of boxing fans, white boxing fans have shifted to MMA is that true or is that just like a kind of a crude analysis of some red-haired Irish freak <laughs> over here in London? You're definitely speaking to something. I would I would say the people who follow it intensely, the people who are hardcores, as they call them, would be the more white reactionary. But when you have like a mega card with a bunch of stars, then you get much more of a diverse crowd. That's why like if you have a small fight night card, a non-pay-per-view event, you know, Twitter to even like the audience there before COVID, the audience there might be like booing, you know, certain fighters from other countries, right? Or chanting USA or all over social media, they might be saying a lot of like racist reactionary stuff. But when you have a mega card, then you see the full breadth of MMA, which is, it's not just reactionaries when it's the big card. So that's why they would boo Donald Trump. And that's why they would cheer for Bernie Sanders or uh, boo people like Kobe Covington, who's uh, uh, an extreme, like racist reactionary. So it's true that the day to day people are those white reactionaries. But I think the reason why the people who doesn't fit into that mold don't follow it every day is because of those people. But 
it does speak to like something that's so compelling about it that for the big cards that it pulls in everybody back. It pulls everybody back who might even like not want to be involved with it, but they just like it. Yeah, no, I, I see. It's like a kind of a similar dynamic, I think, in the boxing, like this whole era of like Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao. You had like, you basically online, you had like basically race war trolls at it 24 7 for yeah. five, six years. You know, that's just like a kind of its own small subculture. But when like the actual fight gets made, you get like just regular boxing fans push into it and it, oh, it you know, it, it dominates and blasts away that kind of undercurrent of just out and out <laughs> pure fucking racism yeah and i think also some i think maybe there's like a low-key embarrassment about liking combat sports for uh, a lot of leftists because i see some recognizable names on twitter that you me like a lot of people recognize i don't want to point them out but then i see them all of a sudden start following me or liking my combat sports tweets but they never mention it so it means that it's, it's one of those things where it's like I like it, but I don't want people to know I like it. It's a very weird one. Like, uh, I, I sometimes I really struggle with, like, my boxing. I, I, I struggle with, you know, just how damaging it is for fighters on average. And the, and, and I'm trying to weigh my, my obvious enjoyment and kind of addiction to watching it. You know, so I can understand... I, I, just, I can just I can just see like, you know, I, I, I noticed that own contradiction in my own following of the sport. So I can definitely understand it in other people who aren't as into it as as I am, you know, because they are they're brutal sports like boxing and MA. They're 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 just in a totally different category to every other sport, pretty much. Well, other than American football, I would say. Yeah, maybe as a Europe as a European like we just look at American football and we go, ah, them boys. Look at all, <laughs> look at all that padding and helmets they're wearing. Yeah, them boys should play rugby. <laughs> no, uh, no, yeah. So they do get it. They get a pounding, but like I, I, I can't give. I don't know. I can't give it to them. You know, I can't. I can't. <laughs> Sorry, this is my bias coming out here. Why well, you think American sport, football is as brutal as these other sports? Oh, more so. I mean, you could look at it theatrically like that, but. Regardless, like the amount of what's called CTE, like brain damage that's coming out. It's like, you know, then it's like almost like be, trying to be like, I don't know, trying to be more macho than the macho reactionaries. It's not helpful sometimes. It's like they're, look at the numbers, like they are getting brain damaged really badly. So something is happening there, right? Oh, no, definitely. Yeah. You know, and even even soccer players from the 60s and 70s in, in Europe, like, they're all dying very young of uh, Alzheimer's because the old heavy balls, they were like pigs, you know, proper leather, heavy ones. And they were heading the ball so often. Yeah. A lot of them are, they're all dying like of literally in their mid 60s of Alzheimer's. You know, it's kind of, it's pretty brutal. But uh, yeah, at the rates, they they probably don't compare to boxing though, do they? For for brain damage. I would, I would find that hard to believe. I wonder, I've no idea. That's a question people bring up. I don't know if people know for sure, just because football is so much bigger of a sport here in the U.S. that all the studies have been done on football, not as much on boxing. So, yeah, it's harder to tell. And also, football has like this professional level where everybody's gigantic and super athletic and running at each other, you know, full, full speed. Versus boxing has like from amateurs to, you know, lower level that may never fight at this high level, you know, and then you have like the high level fighters. There's people who are like pro and and undefeated, but they had like, I don't know, 20 amateur fights and now 10 and 0 as a pro versus people who've had 200 amateur fights and and so forth. So I think the cohort is so di- so much more diverse than than football that that also is challenging than to create a study. Yeah, and it's not the money in, in boxing compared to football either. You know, who's going to fund it? Bob Arum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the other problem. Like, what yeah. audience, like, what public outcry is there for you to figure this out, right? The the football studies happened because there was a, a backlash. There were people demanding it. Whereas in boxing, like I said, the fans show up for the big fights, but they're not like everyday hardcores. And maybe the ones that are, even in boxing, are the ones who don't care about brain damage, though. You know, there is quite a few of them. I listen to, like, quite a few boxing podcasts, and 
like some of these <laughs> fight fans are are fairly brutal like you know they they literally want the guy knocked out like i mean they want them out cold you know and you know i, I was watching some old you know, well, it's interesting we're talking about the brain damage. It's like, you know, it's been common knowledge about CTE. Like, you know, there is the whole term punch drunk. You know, that's, I wonder how old that phrase is. You know, that's probably hundreds of years old. Yeah. You know, that it's kind of like nearly a new thing in, in football to the, maybe to the regular pundit that they're hearing that, oh God, these guys are getting, you know, brain damage. Yeah. I read this Japanese manga called Hajime no Ippo. Have you ever heard of it? No, no, no. It's a popular boxing manga, but it's been around since the 80s. And so it's been continuously printing and having new issues since then to today. And even back in the 80s, that character and the characters in the, the Japanese comic were talking about be, like the effects of being punch drunk. There you have it. So we're talking about a bit of the reactionary kind of element to the MMA scene. Like you were doing some stuff that was like literally talking about not just kind of, you know, right wing, but actual major stars who are kind of neo, well, are neo-Nazis. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I, I did, I was aware of that for a while. They were talking about the Gracie brothers and that. But, you know, I I'm still kind of shocked when, you know, you see, did does one of them have an actual swastika tattoo? None of the major stars have swastika tattoos, but that has been an issue where maybe they sign a new fighter. Then later it's revealed that they have swastikas, right? So what do they do there? Or like it's one of the feeder shows to the UFC or it's a non, maybe it's not UFC, but it's one of the major other promotions. And also in the subsidiary like uh, market of like different types of grappling or martial arts tournaments, people with swastikas will show up. So it's there. And then if you look into a lot of the military apparel kind of casual wear companies that are associated with MMA and UFC that might sponsor, and you look into some of their stuff, then you see, oh, it might not be outright swastikas, but the dog whistles are there. Like, especially if you know about white supremacy, like Rhodesia is a big popular one. And you see a lot of these apparel companies always alluding to Rhodesia, right? And that's all like officially there, not not just even in... Uh, in combat sports, even like American NASCAR and stuff like that, they're all there as well. And like, do they have like 88 and shit like that under apparel or stuff? Not like something that they would wear like in the UFC to the fight because, well, one thing, UFC doesn't even let you wear your own sponsors anymore. So you have to wear their uniforms, even though you're a supposedly uh, a freelancer. So you don't see that kind of stuff anymore. But back in the old days, when they w could wear whatever they wanted, you would see some weird stuff on their shorts. Like, was there some famous gyms that were kind of associated with like some neo-Nazi types? Did I see you talking about that? Well, there's a lot of like outright Nazi gyms or far right gyms, and then they train MMA. And then if you're around long enough, because the general level of MMA isn't that high compared to other sports, so what I mean by that is, and by other sports, I mean professional sports because the pay is lower. So a lot of the plus athletes will go to another sport. You rarely see somebody give up like a high profile career to come to MMA or never. You never see that. But you, what you have in MMA is a lot of people who didn't, things didn't work out for them in their primary sport and they switched over to MMA. And even though they weren't good enough for that professional sport, they're still like better than everybody else as far as athleticism in MMA. So my point is that the barrier to get into like some of these shows are much lower. So if you have a MMA gym and it's full of far right shitheads and you've been around long enough, you could probably train them well enough to get them into some of these shows. And then from there, if you, it's a numbers game. If you train enough people, then you could probably get them into the bigger shows. And on top of that, there's a lot of fusion. So MMA, a lot of people train at different gyms. There's a lot of like network effect. There's a lot of interconnectedness. So a lot of these ideas also show up in the mainstream, mainstream gyms with like a lot of top name fighters. So like at Jackson Wink, which is probably one of the most premier MMA gyms that has had and still has a lot of the top UFC fighters like John Jones. You know, they've been in the news 
where they've been doing stuff with the far right militia in New Mexico to hanging a literal QAnon banner above their gym. And the coaches are always spouting QAnon, racist, anti-Semitic conspiracies. So it all kind of intertwines. It's hard to separate one thing from another. It's kind of like a social fabric because a lot of MMA itself is being trained in like these tucked away, like middle of nowhere places. And part of that reasoning is because wrestling is popular there. And secondly, because there's no quote unquote distraction. So you're in the middle of nowhere, but then you have all these people in the US, what what do they call them? They call them like off gridders, these type of like survivalist libertarian types who are also there too. So it all kind of like merges and mind melds and creates this culture. Yeah, especially, you know, you have like, I presume it's like boxing where there's like gyms like need sparring and you have big interaction between different gyms and networks can form ideas spread that way too. I would say boxing, the reason why it hasn't been as bad is because a classic boxing gym is more, is much more anarchistic, I would say, where you go in and you just pay a day rate, right? It's run kind of like a group owned club or a co-op. You pay a day rate, which is really cheap. And then you work out on your own. There's no classes, right? And then if you want to find a trainer, you work that out on your own with somebody there. And it's all very like DIY, right? Which is starting to change because a lot of boxing gyms are starting to adopt like the martial arts model of having classes and now having what's called a tuition where you have to pay an exorbitant, you know, monthly fee to train at this boxing gym. Right. But I would still say that's emerging, but classic boxing gyms, because of that style, if you have those kind of reactionary elements, it could still stay isolated. It doesn't permeate throughout the whole gym. Because everybody's doing their own thing in a gym. Whereas in a martial arts gym, everybody's doing things together. Yeah, there's a much more of a master guru kind of a thing in, in uh, MMA gyms. Well, I was going to say to your point about master guru, even if you have left politics, if you train martial arts, there is a blind spot where I've seen socialists, Marxists, anarchists, doesn't matter what the tendency is, but they're domain specific. So they could apply this logic of politics to everything else. But when it comes to their dojo or their martial arts gym, they just put the blinders on and they will like defend or like apologize for just openly, openly obvious, explicit reactionaries to fascists. Because this is something I talk to a lot of people about within the Southpaw community, which is that cult overrides politics. Meaning you could have whatever left politics, but the cult is more powerful than that. So you could have, you could go to, you know, this karate gym and you have such reverence for the teacher. You might be like, no, no gods, no masters, everything else. But here you venerate them so much. And so even if they say shitty things, you'll defend them because your association, that karate association to you is more important to you than being a leftist. Does that make sense? That wasn't apparent to a lot of us within the community at first, but it became very apparent within a couple of months that a lot of people, even if they are like an activist, I've seen activists, you know, people who are like hardcore into collectives and whatever, but they are still like reactionary when it comes to the gym. Yeah, there's plenty of uh, leftists who uh, like like a good guru themselves, you know? Yeah. It's like the sect form in the gym. (laughs) Well, it's not like like you adopt left politics and it's like a magic pill that cures you of all your reactionary tendencies, right? So you you grow up watching all these martial arts movies. And so you're conditioned to have like this magical fantasy idea about it in your head. Left politics isn't going to just make you delete that from your brain. It's still going to be there. And also on top of that, you don't even know you should delete it. You don't even know that's reactionary or problematic. It doesn't even occur to you because you always considered martial arts something that is in a vacuum that that is away from everything else. You know, I would say that in sports that I don't know, I'm going to make a real generalization with no no facts here. But I think typically in in a sport an elite sport, professional sport, because a lot of the times specifically in, in non team sports, so like, you know, boxing or these type of ones that because they, they have to fight and they have to do it all themselves, they feel like 
everything I do is because of what I've done and I've sacrificed myself and that. that it it kind of lends people to not having a kind of, you know, social or communist, whatever outlook that they feel like I did this on my own back. I'm an individual. And I think also with the coach, I, I think I think there's a bias there. Oh, yeah. Like from from what I see is like the amount of sports stars that that should know better that come from bad backgrounds. You know, I, I think it has to be something, a tendency that's that's going on. So going back to like no gods, no masters, right? You could have somebody saying that. But if it's a guy who's like all about that, ask them, hey, what do you think about Bruce Lee? And they completely forget that they were all talking about no gods, no masters. And they'll just just like gush about Bruce Lee and how he's a god, right? So they could be talking about those types of ideas like five minutes prior and completely forget that they mentioned it or the contradiction here. Yeah, like how many fight fans go, oh yeah, you know, like commies or socialists go, yeah, oh my favorite fighter is Mike Tyson. I love Mike Tyson. Mm-hmm. You're going like, he's a rapist. Yeah. You know, a convicted rapist. And they go, oh well, yeah, and then they'll say something like, oh well, I don't know if that was like, you know, there was definitely some gray area around that, I think. You know, Don King said something like he was innocent, you know. <laughs> Get fucked. Get fucked. Man, Mike Tyson is, I even like, uh, talked about Mike Tyson on a, a tweet like a couple of years ago and that got a lot of pushback from leftists. Yeah, that is a thing, especially Mike Tyson, just because he is so dominant, but he comes from that era of like highlights. He was like the first packaged highlights fighter, meaning like he was having these knockouts and TV and HBO would create these like highlight packages just of the knockouts, right? And so then that's when fight fans went from the sweet science and appreciating that to just wanting to see knockouts because they were conditioned to by these promo packages that were featuring Mike Tyson. So not only were they conditioned to only want to see knockouts, they're also conditioned to really like Mike Tyson and to think that is what good boxing is. So then from there, they have such a reverence for Mike Tyson. You know, I've had people where I bring that up about that he is a convicted rapist. And then they're like, oh, yeah, where their love of Mike Tyson as a boxer and that idea of them being a rapist never occurred to them simultaneously. People are the same, though, even with Michael Jackson. Like, how many people listen to Michael Jackson and say, well, I still like his music? Like, I always say to them, this is what I say. I say, OK, imagine now there's a pizza shop right down your street and they've got the best fucking pizza in the world. But then you find out that the fellow who's making the pizza is a kiddie fiddler. Would you still go in and buy his pizza? And they always say no. <laughs> I say, right. Well, fucking you should you should turn off your Michael Jackson then, you know? With Mike Tyson, it's a step further because with uh, Michael Jackson, it happened after he died. So there's like that whole like, well, it's a dead person, right? There's like, and he didn't actually go to jail. Mike Tyson actually went to jail, right? <laughs> like this is case closed. So I guess to build upon your point, that is true. But Mike Tyson's case then based on what you just said becomes even stronger and clearer. And people <laughs> still apologize for him, right? Yeah. People apologize for him. Absolutely. So one thing I'd like to talk about is is the business of UFC. Can you tell us like the business model and, and how, how it works? You know, talking about the business model is one of my favorite ways to kind of explain left politics because you have these control groups. And actually, I think that is why a lot of listeners who just came for MMA and to hear us talk about combat sports became receptive to socialist politics. So you have an example of like three different approaches to labor rights. And they're not all ideal. So the first one is the UFC, which is basically anarcho-capitalism, right? It is just like purely whatever the owners want to do, that's what they do. Then the second tier would be a policy act, which is boxing and the Ali Act. And even there, if you're a boxing fan, you know that that isn't a cure-all. It still has problems. But it's still something that MMA doesn't have. MMA doesn't have the Ali Act. So you can actually compare what a combat sport without the Ali Act looks like. So in that way, before MMA, you didn't know. You just talked shit about it and you just assumed it, it didn't do shit. And now you can compare. It's like, well, it is different from this. And then from policy change, you see 
unions in the, the big ball sports. And even that has problems, right? But you compare unions to the Ali Act and you see how much better unions are. And then the, the last example we don't have is what would sports look like in a post-capitalist society? We don't know. But we have these examples that exist in real life right now. So you could all kind of, so you could compare. So then the worst one is UFC and MMA because you could actually see the numbers and the numbers became revealed because there's uh, something called a monopsony, which is like a legal way to say monopoly, but they can't go after them for an actual monopoly. So they're saying it's a monopsony and it's like a really wonky term that you could look up, but there's a lawsuit against the UFC. So they have to reveal a lot of their financial deals. And then you find out that in MMA, in the UFC, fighters are only making like anywhere from like 10 to 20% of revenue or 15 to 20% revenue. Whereas in boxing, you get paid depending on the card, like depending on the fighter, you could get paid way more than that. The thing that differentiates it from union is, is variable. You could get 80% of revenue. Sometimes you could go down to like 30% of revenue to the fighters, right? Now, unions is much closer on average of all the ball sports. It's much closer to 50%. So that's where the UFC business model is, where they have no Ali Act, they have no unions, and they get paid 15 to 20% of revenue. What's the baldy headed guy, the Dana head White. promoter again? Dana White, Jack, forgot his name. Dana White, like, he's, he's become a billionaire, hasn't he? Uh, if he's not a billionaire, he's pretty close to a billionaire. And the guy, what's the name of the guy who owned the UFC? Did he sell it recently? What was his name? The Fertitta Brothers. Was it another guy? Was it a guy with a Z in it or something like that? Yeah, yeah. No, they call their parent company Zufa, but that's not their last name. Okay, that's, yeah, that's what I was saying. So their last yeah. name is Fertitta. And so are, did they, are they like, did they sell it for something crazy like $7 billion or something? It was like a little bit over $4 billion. You know, what's interesting is that those two brothers come from casinos from the Vegas casinos. And if you look back into their family history, there's even mob ties to that family. Surprise, right? Surprise, surprise, yeah. But even with that said, now we have a control group because now UFC is owned by a Hollywood company, WME, right? And they have a business deal with Disney, ESPN. So a lot of fighters and a lot of people who left the company will tell you that it was still better run as far as fairness to fighters when it was run by casino mafia guys than it is by Hollywood guys. <laughs> that's good that's too good that's too good and that's real right like you, we have that comparison also but at least they uh, donated to Joe Biden huh? <laughs> did they I don't know I'm joking <laughs> <laughs> well the funny thing is the people who, who started this whole private equity group is uh, one of the people is uh, Ari Emanuel who is I don't know if he still is but he was Donald Trump's agent so the whole Donald Trump and Ari Emanuel UFC relationship goes way back. Can you explain like to people what the Ali Act actually did? Because most people will have never heard of it. Yeah, it's one of those things where if you read the law, you don't know what that looks like in real life, right? So if I read the law or you look it up, you're like, okay, so what does this do? Like, it doesn't sound like it does anything. But what it does do is it got rid of a lot of conflict of interest, which they're figuring out how to get around these loopholes. But a lot of conf conflict of interest of like promoters doing bad things against the interests of their fighters. And also it allowed fighters to become their own promoters and get a slice of the pie. And there's a lot of things that you can't do. So you can't run the UFC model in boxing. That's why the UFC was trying to start their own boxing promotion called Zufa Boxing which I don't know where it is right now, but one of the things that they ended up doing is they decided they're not going to be a, a boxing promotion, but instead be a TV platform for other boxing promotions to run their shows because they couldn't run it like the, they can't run what they do with the UFC and boxing because of the Ali Act. So to give you an idea, that is the thing that stopped Zufa Boxing from becoming a promotion. Yeah, like I remember like just like some historical like before the Ali Act came in, I think it was I think it was Joe Louis that when he wanted to get the title shot, he had to sign up 10% of all his future revenue on every fight. Yeah, I think for listeners, American listeners, you're talking about Joe Louis, right? Yeah, all right. You call him Joe Louis. Yeah, sorry, Joe Louis. We call him Joe Louis. Joe Louis. We call him Joe Louis too. Joe Louis. And like... 
I, I think that's true. So for every every fight he had after that, he had to give, I think it was something like crazy, like 10% of gross. Yeah, yeah. Something I've heard like that. absolutely like insane thing. And they could use that to basically st- to stop like a good fighter, you know, becoming champion. One thing that boxing fans say about UFC though, well, UFC is weird because it's essentially a monopoly, you know. They have a, they have monopoly power there. And like in, in boxing, it, you have pure anarchy. You know, you have got four major title belts and then you've got, you know, in America, you've got two or three main promoters. In the UK, you've got two or three. In like Germany, you've got two or three. But ar- around the world, there are like probably 15 major promoters or 20 promoters you know, and they're all battling in. But in UFC, you have one company has the belt and they control rankings. And boxing fans look at MMA with envy because they say, like, you know, if you're seventh and in your title rankings, you know, you have to beat sixth or, you know, there is some reasonable level of elimination and they match fighters competitively. Where in boxing, there's just this disastrous way of like, faking rankings with rubbish fighters in here and you could be a world-class fighter and get towards a world title and never had in, have a, an even a competitive fight you know so it's one of those weird things where it's like you know as a as a fan like you want like you want the fighter to to get the boxing money or better right you know in, in a capitalist system you'd prefer to be a boxer than an mma fighter but from a fan the the way they organize it with their monopoly power it does work you know and that's to the you know eternal shame of of boxing i mean i think uh a lot of that comes from boxing fans looking at ufc and mma casually because if you watch it from the day to day a lot of those ideas are actually myths ufc has the same problems boxing has except other unique problems So let me give you an example. You're talking about the matchups you want, right? Now in the UFC, let's say uh, you have featherweight, which is 145, our version. The UFC version is 145. Then you have lightweight, which is 155, right? What's the weight difference in pounds? That's 10 pounds. That's a lot of difference. So what happens when you have somebody who wants to be a champ champ? So they go up, challenge for their featherweight. They go up, challenge for the 155, and they win it. Now this one guy has both titles. And so not only are you tying up two divisions now, but because the two divisions are so apart, you don't even have like divisions within it. So like, you know, sometimes like a fighter might be like, okay, I can't fight for the the 155 championship because this guy's like on a break. You know, he's like taking a two year sabbatical because he, he won so much money. Maybe I can move down from 155 to like 151 and try to challenge for that title. Right. Or somebody who's at 145 is like, oh, I'm going to move up three more pounds or whatever. They don't even have those options. So then, so you're talking about like not seeing the fights you want in a way because of this system, you can make that even worse because there's not as many divisions as boxing. And so that creates these bottlenecks, especially because UFC is always trying to create these champ champ fights. And then as you go up in weight, it's 185 and then the next division up is 205, right? That's like, that's a lot of weight difference. So then if you have somebody at 185 winning the 205, that's a lot of people who are stuck and can't even move in between divisions to try to go for a title. And that could ruin some fighter's career. So if you have a fighter A you love because of these kind of weird mismatches and weird bookings, their whole potential career can get ruined or they could just be sidelined for a while. We do like in boxing used to have only like I think seven divisions, but now it's been most of them have been split, you know. So you have like welterweight 147, like like middle 154. So they go up in seven pounds, usually a lot, yeah. But like that is that is true, like and uh, the the weight divisions are much more brutal. There's no essentially like there's no light featherweight, there's just featherweight. Like, do they have one thing? One thing I kind of a lot of boxing fans shit on women's boxing, you know, for the, you know, for kind of sexist reasons. But like, I don't really watch it because I just think the the talent pool is is tiny compared to boxing, the men's boxing. You know, it's like there are some women's sports like tennis that are very high quality. And like, you know, I think people kind of watch men and women's tennis pretty much 
equally there's not you know you, you don't have people saying I'm not watching women's tennis it's a lot of rubbish when it comes to something like boxing I think you, they're they're just vastly different standards but when it comes to MMA like I get the impression that the actual the, the fighter pool is just radically smaller than say the boxing worldwide pool is would they be able to maintain like quality with they introduce like the different divisions do you reckon for women's they only cap out at like 145 that's the highest you go so that's how that's how ufc has figured out the limitations uh for women's division because the pool is smaller but for men's yeah they could definitely add more divisions now you could argue what the talent's going to be like if you do that especially as you go up but from 170 and below if you add more divisions you're going to still see a lot of exciting fighters. And I would even say for women's division, you could even add a couple of, at least one more like lighter weight category and you'll still have a pretty good talent pool. The women's division, same thing as men's, it just starts earlier. The higher you go up in weight, the, the pool gets smaller. I would say for men's MMA, it's like 185 and above. It starts thinning out. Um, with women's, it's like when you get to 145 and anything above that, it starts thinning out. Like uh, one thing I'd have to say though, weirdly for like combat sports, MMA is pretty, pretty progressive in marketing their women fighters. Yeah. Um, is that fair? Like, cause in boxing, it's a joke, you know, in boxing, women's boxing is a total, like the promoters only, if they promote any of the, any of the women's boxers, they're doing a bit more now in the UK. It's purely, I think to have a cheap option to fill up some time on a card you know, and say it's a world title fight instead of having it like being a low level, you know, British area fight. You know, it sounds a lot better. But like, you know, but it doesn't get any exposure. But like, they get a lot of exposure on, on the uh, UFC cards. Yeah, I think if you compare it to boxing, it does. If you compare the exposure they get to men's fighters, not as much. Okay, yeah. Like, would you say they're way behind, or because some of them were, some of them crossed over mainstream? Like, what was that uh, wrestler one who got? Yeah, beaten? Ronda. Oh, Ronda Rousey. Yes. Well, I think she opened the the what what did they call it? What's the cliche? She opened the gates, right? And I think boxing, even trying to promote more women fighters, is directly as a response to the popularity of Ronda Rousey. So it's they're only doing the right thing because they feel like they're incentivized to do it. Ronda's gone. So they're like, here's all these people that wanted a woman fighter, but now they don't have one. So they're looking to build one in boxing to take all of that Ronda energy over, right? So I, I feel like that's what they're trying to do with like, you know, Clarissa Shields, Katie Taylor, like people like that. But I would say in MMA, Ronda, because it happened in MMA, is it, still kind of the uh, after effects where because she made this division so popular, they're still riding that momentum. And there's people who got a lot of star power from either facing Ronda or being associated with her or being associated with that division during that time that Ronda was making that division. And also they're going slow. They're, they only, they're adding divisions in the women's division very slowly. But also I, I would say it's, it goes back to what I said about other sports paying more. Because it's all relative. So with the men's division, because a lot of the really plus athletes go to other sports, like I said, then uh, the general talent pool as far as athleticism, just purely athleticism, isn't super high in MMA. It, it can get pretty high as you go lower in weight because a lot of small athletic people don't have other sports they could go to. But because it is still like not, you're not going to see like a LeBron James in MMA as far as that level of athleticism then the men's division doesn't seem like that much more athletic than the women's division. So, you know, you have men making it to the UFC who started their first martial art in at like 25. You still see that. So like, women, crazy. So, imagine just... doing that in boxing, even with boxing's like all these bullshit <sighs> divisions and, and organizations, that's still super rare. Whereas in MMA, that's pretty common. So then for women who come in, their parents like maybe were, were sexist and didn't let them do combat sports and they started at 18, right? And then they come into the UFC at 22, their skill quality isn't going to be that much worse than the men's. 
because the men also like might have started later and their counterparts who were really athletic went off to professional soccer or like uh, American football or basketball or something else. I'm just thinking what you said about like fighters coming to boxing late like in the last 20 years I've been following the sport like I'd say the only top level boxer was Sergio Martinez do you know Sergio Martinez no. he's a middleweight champ he was Argentinian oh yeah yeah he yeah, was yeah. really good yeah 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 and like he was a footballer and he like broke his ankle or or uh, something like that and he started picking up boxing when he was like 19 and he got to the highest level but that's super rare and he was like a professional football he, like he wasn't just like a plumber yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. it's like that's one thing I, I kind of find with MMA a bit. Is I, I feel like the talent pool, it's kind of, because in reality, it's a new sport. Like, you know, you go to, say, a small country like Ireland and you go around, there, there'll probably be a hundred boxing clubs in Ireland, right? And even though we've had Conor McGregor, I would, I don't know if there's five or six MMA clubs in Ireland. I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I never heard of one anywhere near me okay. where I, I grew up. So it's like, I wonder like what the actual, it's, it's to be expected though, because it's a new sport too, but like, particularly if the money is not good and the brutality of the sport in, it, it seems like it's, it's kind of stuck in this kind of spot whereby it's very profitable for the owners, but like it doesn't attract the highest talent and yeah. the wages aren't great. It's kind of a weird, it's weird it's such a prominent sport given that kind of combination. So I did actually look up the statistics on this because I knew I was going to be wildly incorrect here. So the Irish Athletic Boxing Association has currently over 360 clubs affiliated across the north and south of Ireland. And... From what I can tell, there seems to be around 40 or 50 MMA gyms in Ireland. That's including like things for kickboxing and jujitsu and, and general martial arts. So that was that was higher than I expected. You know, there's probably been quite a boom since Conor McGregor has happened. But still, it's a much smaller size and it certainly wouldn't have the institutional longevity of boxing across the country to your earlier question that is why they're they're not even like feminists they're not trying to like promote women's mma and they still don't do it as much as men but the reason why they do it is because the whole thing the whole thing the 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 talent pool isn't that great so why the the women's division doesn't stand out that much right because of the whole that's just a general problem and and uh i think before people knew what people were getting paid there was this idea that maybe there was money to be made in MMA. So uh, a lot of high level collegiate wrestlers in the US were going over to MMA. But now even that has started to drop off because they're hearing from their friend that they wrestled in college with. They're like, no, no, I'm only making this. And they're like, what? I'm making more than that from my, my day job, you know, with my regular office job. So why am I going to go over to MMA if I'm making more than you right now? So there was this period where plus athletes from American wrestling were coming over, but you're even seeing that to start to drop off. But UFC doesn't care. That's part of why they have everybody wear a uniform. They don't want to have any personalities. And especially after Conor McGregor, I think they also learned their lessons. Like, we can't let somebody get that powerful. We can't let anybody get into a position where they're bigger than the UFC. So that way, we can just throw in whoever, and they're just going to watch it because it's a UFC product, not because they like fighter A or B or fighter A or B is really good. On this episode, you heard the team tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.
Thank you.